Maybe I can just briefly say hi um, from TU Darmstadt. So today is with us the Dean of Material Science Department, Professor Albe. And um, my name is Claudia Finner. Um, I'm head of our Asia office at National Chengkong University in Tainan. Um, but today we would like to focus on the study programs in material science and not on general information about TU Darmstadt. But later on, if you have some questions, please feel free to ask any questions you would like. But maybe now we start with a talk first. Okay, thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Jade, for the kind introduction. Yeah, I'm representing the Department of Materials and Geosciences. And even the last aspect is of interest, as we will see in a minute. And in order to introduce our study programs, I decided also to um, show you a part of uh, our science because both is related. And this is why I've chosen the, the we'll pick the title "Resource Efficient Materials for Future with Renewable Energies," which is kind of also of our research theme. Um, so now we switch from TU Dresden, which you have possibly seen before, to another TUD, TU Darmstadt. Um, the difference is we are closer to the big airport. And uh, so in the middle of Germany, why I'm showing that because the next picture, which I choose to introduce our research scenes. Do you see my cursor here? Do you see my arrow moving? I hope so. Yeah, that the next picture was done, taken here in, in Galicia, which is in Spain. And um, this is what you see here, a nice picturesque landscape. Um, and you would think this has been carved by Mother Nature. It's called Las Meludas. So if you have a chance to go to Spain, visit that place. But what it is, is essentially an example of ancient destruction of the environment for the reason that people are always after resources. So this is a gold mine from the old Roman times uh, where they essentially uh, had 20,000 slaves on the spot who were supposed to get the gold out of this mountain area. And they essentially uh, had, had to uh, produce tunnels here. They were flooded with water and then it was essentially mechanical destruction of the uh, environment, which uh, made the gold mine then accessible. And it's kind of, uh, what we are still trying, and it's kind of representative of what we are doing in the department. Number one, we are interested in what is geo resources we can use, where they are available, how can we exploit them without destroying our environment? And in the second step, how can we make useful materials uh, for us, which help to uh, keep our uh, world uh, as a livable and, and sustainable environment. Um, so the, here, essentially, you see the research uh, theme of the materials and geoscience department that we work on sustainable use of geo resources and resource efficient materials for future with renewable energy. So this is kind of the, the big theme. And uh, let me dive directly into the research because, as you will later see, there is a direct connection also to our teaching programs. So we are after resource efficient materials, um, which, for instance, make use of less hazardous elements. One big theme here is, for instance, to get uh, lead out of materials and make lead free ceramics. That was a big research team and still is a theme in, in our department. Then we are currently working on magnetic materials. As you might know, every electrical engine has a hard magnetic core which is only uh, effective if you use rare earth metals. Um, so this is a big theme. If you want to have renewable energies, you have to improve the performance of the electrical engines and, and make sure that you use materials where you also have a continuous material supply. Uh, secondly, we are interested in using magnetic materials for refrigeration. So solid state refrigeration as a clean, environmentally friendly alternative to conventional compression-based cooling techniques. And, and thirdly, the question, how can we make use of the energy we get for free from the sun? You know, Germany is a country with very little natural resources, so we can't just use water coming from the mountains. Uh, so this is why, for instance, uh, using sunlight is a big theme. And uh, so one, one possibility to make better use of the um, 
spectrum of the uh, sunlight that we have is, for instance, to work on tandem solar cells as depicted here, where you use the entire spectrum and eventually not only use a solar cell to produce an electrical current and electrical energy, but possibly to directly integrate the possibility to use that energy for water splitting. And then at the same time, you have uh, already produced the energy storage medium. So this is uh, on, a, on a superficial scale, the key themes we are addressing. And before I jump into our study programs, I just want to give you a little flavor of what our daily life is about in terms of um, uh, looking into a research topic, which is related to the pillar here, materials for electronics and electrochemistry. Again, everything with the uh, glasses on, on our eyes that we wanna make uh, uh, sustainable materials. That means we substitute uh, poisonous elements and we care about circular use of the materials. And when we design materials, we make heavy use of computational methods. And in order to clarify where the challenges are, I picked one example where I wanna spend a few minutes. So it will be partly a scientific talk um, that you see what, what we are driven by, what is the research questions and how we try to solve that. And the example is a sustainable battery materials, lithium ion batteries, as you might know, um, they, they are critical in the sense that most of them still contain cobalt and here you see a cobalt mine in the Congo and uh, how the cobalt is extracted there from the minerals. And obviously that is one, one of the issues, um, but also recycling, reuse of, of batteries is, is a topic. And um, so we have to, to ask the question, um, what is an optimal use of our resources? How do we design the material that we can reuse them? And how could we replace critical elements? Um, and here you see in this slide, it's taken by a report from the uh, European Commission that cobalt, which I just mentioned, uh, is one of the elements which has a, a moderate supply risk. However, if you look at the polit political conditions and under what circumstances, as you just have seen on one uh, picture, it's exploited, uh, then we should get rid of that sooner than later. And that's, there's a heavy demand from industry. Okay, um, so what, what can we do to make better uh, lithium ion batteries? That's the, the question. First of all, one can work on, uh, on, on methods, how to make them lasting longer. I mean, as you know, from your uh, laptop or from your mobile phone, after a couple of years, batteries are degraded. So, I mean, just work on the uh, lifetime of the system. And, and one issue I will mention later is that in these, uh, interlayer systems um, like lithium cobalt oxide, essentially you intercalate and deintercalate the lithium. And when you do that, and this is what you see on the schematic, uh, the less lithium you have, the higher is a tendency that the material wants to change the stacking between the transition metal oxide layers. So because the screening effect of the lithium is going away, the system wants to shift planes. And in order to do that, it, it needs dislocations. And here you see it in the electron microscope analysis, dislocations are running through the system. And what we recently started to study together with, with industry partners is to figure out how we can optimize uh, this dislocation motion, which you necessarily need, need to um, drive the phase transition. And, and the hope would be, and this is a fact that at the moment, if you take a conventional cathode, you only exploit 50% of its theoretical capacity because you never go to the fully delithiated state. And this is because we need to suppress the reactions of these dislocations, which drive the phase transitions. And so we are currently working on concepts by using bigger primary particles, by avoiding side reactions, and certainly Another is, issue is uh, the conventional degradation effect is a mechanical stresses which build up because of the variation of the lithium content and make the material fail. So another aspect in the um, uh, battery thing is to understand how good do we understand, for instance, cobalt-free replacements. And uh, when 
in the 70s, people came up with lithium cobalt oxide. They also discussed nickel oxide because it's uh, electronically isostructural and even the crystal structure in the lithium nickel cobalt, lithium nickel oxide is identical to the cobalt oxide. And here you see another material science problem. So this is the result of phase diagram analysis of different groups. And you see this is even recent work. And well, whoever you ask, you might get a different answer. So on the one hand, we try to make long lasting uh, batteries. On the other hand, we not even understand uh, properly reproducibly uh, basic properties of a key element, namely the cathode material. A true materials science problem, which is directly linked to the necessities we have in, in turning over our energy supply and on energy uh, saving. And here again, uh, it comes into play what we know very well in Darmstadt, namely combining experimental information with theoretical predictions. So this is a result of a theoretical prediction of the phase diagram. And the experts among you know that from the chemical potential, one can directly predict the discharge curve, which is a red line here. And the blue one is the experiment. So this is a high fidelity computer model using electronic structure calculation. And you see it has nothing to do or little to do with the experimental reality. And so that was a problem that has uh, driven us for almost two years to solve it. And um, the result was we learned the experiment is not ideal. There is impurities. And so we modified uh, the, the model and included the role of anti-sites and uh, lithium defici uh, uh, nickel deficiency. And then you see, then you get very close to the experiment. So an example where the combination of basic science, theoretical analysis, and uh, state-of-the-art experiments help us in better understanding uh, the properties of important technologically relevant materials, which bring us closer to a world where we can make less and less use of critical elements. Last aspect in the, from the battery corner, just to, to show you a few things we are driven by, is also to <coughs> reduce the volumetric and gravimetric energy density. Here you see the development in lithium ion batteries over the years. You see there's tremendous progress, which you also realize in your computer or in the uh, range of your electrical car. Um, and, and the key aspect is most of the uh, volumetric density is due to the liquid electrolyte. And, and one key idea is to get rid of this liquid electrolyte and replace it by a solid electrolyte. At the same time, the hope is that one can prevent this mechanism here where you see from the lithium anode, dendrites are growing into the cathode, creating shortcuts. And this is on the a well-known failure of these batteries. So if you were to replace everything like that by a, a solid electrolyte, you would be much better. Um, so it's also a working arena where we are active. And what you see here is that materials, the yellow arrow here is a thiophosphate uh, belonging to the class of sulfates. They have enormous conductivities. You see here uh, several millisiemens per centimeter. That is outperforming even uh, liquid electrolytes. But what you see here, as it comes to the electrochemical stability window, these materials are not competitive. So here, a typical material science challenge, how we can get together a wonderfully conducting material and how can we stabilize it when it gets in contact with active materials so that we, at the end, can produce an all solid state battery. And the vision at the end of the day, let me skip this here, um, that we could produce here is such a solid state battery where you see a composite anode, composite cathode, and the orange part is the solid electrolyte. Um, we could produce something like that, for instance, by 3D printing. So make better materials by alternative new materials and by new processes. So this, in a nutshell, gives you one example on, on how we work and what we are interested in, what our research interests are, and, and certainly that reflects back into our study program. Okay, before I talk about the study program, a few words on who we are, which is also possibly of interest to you to get an idea uh, which faculty members are running around, what is their interest. So we have this group here in pink of people working on electronic properties, thin films. So this is all kinds of thin film deposition techniques, CVD, PVD, laser ablation, um, chemical routes, and uh, 
surface spectroscopy, for instance, XPS, uh, HPS, and so on, um, one, one big research pillar. Then we have here this group of people working on, on functional ceramics that also would include uh, the battery corner, but also the piezo ceramics and uh, certainly material for catalysis. Um, then here a group of people working on magnetic materials. Um, for instance, Oliver Gutfleisch being very active in the arena of magnetic calorics and uh, new high performance magnets. And then what is important, a strong group of modelers who closely interact with the experimentalist and a large fraction of, of research groups, which is active and very involved characterization, structural, but also characterization of electronic uh, and microstructural properties. And so this is essentially the, the team, which is also teaching our um, study program and why I'm showing here this um, um, UHV machine, which is essentially one of the machines where we produce uh, thin films and can in situ do characterization, because in our study program, an important feature is that all students work on our research equipment. So if you join our master program, you will do lab courses where you work on these machines, learn how to handle that, and how to run experiments. And, um, we are well equipped also as it comes to characterization, electron microscopy, uh, scanning electron microscopy, and uh, we have one of the biggest computers in the country that we can use for uh, material simulations. So what it says is um, there's state-of-the-art equipment which is accessible also to our students. Okay, so how is education going? And those who joined the previous session from, from TU Jason already, uh, Heard things that it's very similar with us. Um, most of you are certainly or most likely interested in, in the master program, um, but I just wanted to give you the full picture. So on the bachelor level, which is a three years program, uh, you can only start if you know German and uh, the requirements are similar to the one uh, that we just discussed in the, in the previous session. So then after the bachelor, people join our master program. That's a conventional way. And what is also important, because it's very often a question from international students, what, how can I move on with a PhD? So in the, in the German system, um, a typical student is finishing with a master program. Then he looks for an interesting topic, is getting in contact with the professor, and then they have a mutual agreement on a paid position. Um, typically, there is research grants the professors are collecting, and then the higher student, and then the student is accepted by the department as a, a researcher and can carry out the PhD thesis. So the key difference to many other universities that the phase, which I here label doctoral studies, is essentially free of obligatory classes. So you don't have to collect credits and so on. There's just a few courses you're uh, supposed to take, but it's not... Um, that there's intermediate exams and so on and so forth. Um, but in order to enter that, you have to have a master thesis. So essentially, um, this is different, for instance, uh, to, to the system in other countries. Um, okay, what is important for you guys is that you can also enter the uh, master program from outside. This is why we are here. So we have a lot of international admissions here in the materials master program. And what I put here in bold is the fact that this is taught in English completely. So there is no requirement uh, to show any command of the German language. You can directly apply for the English materials uh, program. Also the German students who uh, did our German bachelor have to prove um, that they know English well enough to join that program. So this is essentially what is different, and uh, at the moment, I think we are still the only place in Germany which has a complete co curriculum in material science taught in English. Um, so this is the, the important information here, the yellow arrow. Okay. Um, as a side note, the top of the top students in principle are allowed to directly enter a PhD phase. There is a fast track option if they want. So this is essentially that you don't do the six-month research thesis and directly enter 
the PhD program. So this is uh, them making a path similar to a conventional graduate school, let's say, in the uh, um, US or Australia or UK. Uh, that's very comparable then. Um, but typically, all students finish because the master, because that gives them a degree, and the master thesis very often is already a test bed for then the subsequent PhD. Okay, that's a structure. And, and that's important to know because especially this transition here from the master to the PhD very often um, is a point international students are interested in. Okay, how good are we? Uh, certainly we are very good. Uh, this is um, just uh, the result of a nationwide ranking of, of places where you can study materials in, in Germany and so they don't give grades, but they give here colored ballots and you just have to look how many places have how many green ballots. And so here we are among the very good ones. You see here also the number of students. Uh, in materials, we have about 500 students in Darmstadt. Um, other places are a little bit bigger, just we had Dresden uh, has 270. And, and we, you see um, that our study program is highly ranked. And you also see that um, another slide for advertising our program that we have a continuously raising number of students in our master program. So this is what we started 10 years ago there. We had uh, started with the English master program and ever since then it has continuously raised and 80% out of these uh, uh, 300 students are coming from abroad. So it's a real international uh, community we have here in the materials master science program. Okay, a few words on what can you expect in the, in the curriculum. So it's a two years program. We have four semesters and I go through it with you step by step so that you know what, what you can expect, what is obligatory, what is um, compulsory courses, what is electives. So as I mentioned, there is research labs. So this is where you work with the team on a problem for one or two weeks on one of our research devices. So this is um, kind of advanced lab courses and they run uh, the entire first year. Then what is important, we have a comp um, compulsory education in theoretical or let's say computational methods. Um, so you can choose whether you wanna start with quantum mechanics or micro mechanics, depends a little bit on your research interests and, and, and your um, history. So if you come from physics, you're better taking that because you have done quantum mechanics. If you come from mechanics, you might have seen aspects here, you better take uh, quantum mechanics. Then we have this course, which is essentially uh, introducing you various computational techniques um, that are useful to better describe materials. And then we have a group of all, this is compulsory classes uh, on functional materials, which is related to the research interests we have. So you learn about solar cells, batteries, magnets, and so on. And then the related characterization methods and certainly all uh, relevant materials are driven by defects, especially surfaces, and interfaces. So there's another compulsory course. So this is what everyone has to take. And then on top, we have uh, a group of electives and there you can, as I will show in a second, choose from many, many subjects. And you see in total, this is almost 30 credits to the total program. And the second year, um, okay, and on top, sorry, I forgot that. There's also courses out outside of material science. So we ask you to, I mean, foreign students very often take languages so they learn German, but also uh, 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 courses in, in uh, business or project management are recommended here. So this is essentially courses you take in other uh, departments. Um, and then in the second year, you essentially already start uh, lab work on a uh, more extended level. So half of the semester is what we call an advanced research lab. It's essentially a course you're doing in one of our research teams and you work on a specific problem. Um, and very often this is taken as a precursor to the master thesis. So students try out whether there's a topic of interest to them and then warm up and continue with the master thesis. Um, and on top, um, you still can take elective. So this is essentially the, the two years program. And um, if 
if you want, you can even spend the third semester uh, at another university because there is no compulsory classes, uh, just electives. You could also say, okay, now I'm in Europe. I want to spend one semester in Finland or go to Belgium. So there's a lot of programs. I will mention that uh, in a few minutes uh, again. And here you see, um, without that, I would believe you can read all of that, but just uh, to give you a, a flavor of, of the possibilities in the electives. Um, so this is all uh, examples of classes you can choose in the elective program, uh, depending on your interests, and you're free to choose uh, to specialize in computational methods, in ceramics, in uh, polymers, in semiconductors, uh, in metallurgy, whatever your interests are or take a mixture. So we consult uh, with the students and, and think about a program which makes sense in, in terms of what is a research interest, career interest, and so on. So this is a mandatory element that you consult with a professor in order to choose appropriate courses. Okay, so this is essentially uh, uh, the important facts I, I want to share with you, but I don't want to finish because we are at a European education fair here, um, also to mention the European aspect of our study program. What I have shown uh, to you is the program at TU Darmstadt. The alternative is to apply for one of these so-called European double degree programs. And here you see the titles. We have at the moment three double degree programs, Functionalized Advanced Materials and Engineering, Advanced Materials for Innovation and Sustainability, and the third one is Advanced Materials Innovative Recycling. You see they're uh, all having a different flavor. And, and the key aspect is that you get a double degree, you get a master of science from our university and another one from a European master university. Before I finish, I just want to show you how it works. Uh, quickly go through the program. So the AMIS program has in the focus uh, the uh, question of sustainability, substitution, but also um, material chain optimization. So that fits to what I showed you in the introduction that we really want to educate people for the uh, coming challenges we have here in the materials world. Uh, and that is also important. It, it combines even training in entrepreneurship. Um, so could you start um, your, your startup company at the end of your university time? So there is a tuition fee applying because it's a European program. But what is important, um, there's also support for students. So those who are accepted get uh, support for travel and housing and get uh, a grant which helps in uh, supporting the living expenses. And in short, the first year at TU Darmstadt looks uh, almost identical to our uh, regular program. And then in the second year, you move to Finland, to Belgium, to France. This is a partners here, Alto, Liège, Bordeaux, and Grenoble. And you continue there. And at the end, you get a master degree from both institutions wherever you did your second year. FAME program, the same uh, concept. There's tuition fees, but in the FAME, there is uh, very luxurious scholarships available. Um, so non EU students can apply for grants, uh, which essentially would cover all uh, living expenses you have while being in Europe. And there is different formats. Uh, I can't spend much time on the details, um, but it's a competitive thing. Uh, you apply centrally, and uh, the charm is that you get financial support. The partners are almost the same. There is uh, Portugal involved, Bordeaux, and in Belgium it's Louvain uh, and Liège, and we have another German partner here. And again, you take most of the part of our first year curriculum, and then you have a few fame-specific projects before you then move on to, to another university. And uh, last but not least, um, the AMIR program. Um, that is now different because in the AMIR program, you either start in Lisbon, Bordeaux, or Miskolc, which is in Hungary, and then you choose a second year in Darmstadt. Um, so at that point, you can only come for the second year to Darmstadt, and 
uh, again, there is financial support and um, what is now different that you take in the second year when you are going to Darmstadt, uh, parts of our compulsory program, there is a life cycle class and then you do your master thesis here. Okay, so this is various combinations uh, you can choose and I think that uh, is an attractive bouquet of uh, things and um, yeah, let me finish with that statement that uh, I think nowadays doing a master program material science is, is really one element uh, which uh, at the end puts you in the position to, to help to improve our world by uh, advanced technology. And I think uh, if you're going to want to go from where we possibly are now to something which looks like that, uh, we need more and more uh, excellently educated engineers, which uh, are really driven by their uh, what they're doing and well educated. And I would claim that Darmstadt is a good place to make progress in that direction. Thank you for listening and I hope for questions. Thank you, Professor Alp, uh, bringing us the really clear uh, program structure of material sciences. Uh, especially we are facing energy crisis worldwide. Uh, definitely it's gonna be a prospective uh, study to probably further uh, have more research in. Okay, now let's welcome the questions from our audience board. Uh, either you have a questions about uh, the material sciences studies or uh, in general, if you are interested in applying for TU Darmstadt, uh, you are so free to ask. Uh, we have a Claudia here online with us. Uh, she can do her best to answer your questions for the admission in general. Maybe I start with a question. So sometimes I get the question. Um, I know in Taiwan, you do not have to do the same bachelor and master. So the master can be in a different field than bachelor. So my question to Professor Albe. If the students did not study material science as a bachelor, but from which other fields would you also accept students for the material science master? Yeah, that's a good point, Claudia, because I was uh, not talking about that. So we accept uh, people with a bachelor degree in chemistry, in physics, materials engineering, uh, uh, production engineering, mechanical engineering, and um, chemical engineering. So this is essentially the, the spectrum. Um, and what we do, we check uh, the um, credit transfer script, and if we realize there is significant elements missing that we assume students have, then we very often admit students, but they get uh, some obligatory classes. So let's say if if someone didn't take a kinetics class because uh, she or he did a, a fundamental physics study, um, then we ask uh, that student, okay, we accept you, but please in the first year uh, take this class on top of the uh, study program. So, but um, that that only uh, it's it's perhaps twenty percent of the students get an, an extra requirement. Um, but so the, the spectrum of, of people we are accepting, uh, because it's an interdisciplinary field, uh, goes over the range of, of uh, curricula I just mentioned. Uh, we have another one who has, uh, I think they are studying animal science uh, in the university for bachelor now. So if they would like to apply for um, either environmental study, like uh, environmental engineering or master science, uh, material sciences, what kind of courses would you suggest them to take from now on? Okay, so in uh, at TU Darmstadt, the courses in environmental science and material science are quite different. So our environmental science program is more lean towards civil engineering. Um, so whatever, how to uh, have a solid water supply without uh, pausing resources. The materials program is more geared towards what you have seen here. So if you are, if I get that correctly, are an animal science, you're fairly far away. So that would say to, to be accepted here in, in our department, it, uh, the minimum requirement that, that you did either physics, chemistry, or material science as a minor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um, yeah, with that major, you would be one of the um, boundary cases. Then there is uh, how many spots are available? What is the acceptance rate? Um, so we are at TU Darmstadt, I can't tell. So the acceptance rate depends on the curriculum. Um, so right. we have, uh, for instance, just to give an example, Claudia might correct me, but let's say in, in so sociology, um, there are so many students who want to do that, there are the numbers limited. Um, in materials, we have uh, um, in average 100 beginners per year, and we could easily take 250. Um, so that means we, we don't reject applications because we don't have spots available at the moment, right. um, but we reject students because um, their qualification um, is not sufficient. Um, so essentially the selection criterion is, is uh, the courses students have taken in their bachelor career um, equivalent to what we ask for entry level master students. And then this, this last question, um, what's it like to complete the master yeah. student level for thesis? Okay, as a, um, okay, how does it go with the master thesis? Um, so that's also uh, different to what I understand how it works in, in Taiwan. Um, so you enter, you are admitted to the master program. And as I told you, the first year is uh, mostly classwork and, and the research labs. And then you get to know a number of the faculty members. And so what typically happens that the students then uh, develop some interest. And this is why we have this uh, mentoring system. Um, so in the first semester, they show up and say, okay, I want to do something with renewable energy, for instance. Mm -hmm. And we sit down and say, okay, this would be appropriate courses. Then the students take the classes and then they figure out professor X, Y, Z, oh, this is a interesting topic. And then they approach a professor and say, um, can I work in your lab? And very often, um, the, what, what students also do, uh, even the first year, they already go around and ask, is there a student assistant position available? So we have a fairly strong research program. That means we, we always can, on top of the uh, PhD students or doctoral students, we have student assistants in the research projects. And um, very often, this is first year master students who sniff around, you make a little bit money, you get a task in the lab and then you already see, oh, this is exciting. Or sometimes you realize, oh, this is completely different to what I expected. I better go into another lab. And so this is kind of the process so that um, at latest when you do this advanced research lab in the second year, um, it's kind of a test balloon. You figure out, is that something that works for me? And uh, after that, then you decide where you do your thesis. I mean, it's, it's part of the program. Um, so legally, everyone has the right to do a thesis. It's not that a professor could say, oh, I don't feel like taking you. <laughs> but, uh, but, but clearly, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter that you, that you communicate with the faculty and, and just go where you find that you have an optimal match to your interests and your talents. So when uh, the school is selecting or evaluating the application, uh, aside from their academic background uh, of bachelor, all the other criteria or qualification um, are you looking for? Um, I mean, the, the decision to admit students is primarily based on the, on the academic record. Um, but, um, helps but it's not mandatory to at the moment the situation is you also have to show that you have experience in an uh, industrial company so outside of academia um, mm -hmm. but it's not that we would uh, deny applications of students who didn't do that but we ask students uh, then to do it during their master time in, in, in Germany so if you never have seen a real company from inside uh, it can happen, still happen that we accept you, um, but then you have to do that on top of the study program during a master time. And, and that's uh, typically um, quite a challenge to find a spot. So you have to write applications and get in contact with companies. But uh, what I then, after students went through that and come back from the, from the internships, they told me that was a great experience. 
now I have seen a world I haven't seen before. Um, so this is um, what we ask and uh, what we do in cases where we think, oh, there is a very talented student, wonderful grades, but she or he is in a field far away from us, but we believe the applicant has a potential um, to be successful in our master program. We also do personal interviews. Um, so then we are, so we are sitting there and if from the uh, records we are receiving, um, we are thinking, well, that could be someone who could succeed in our program, but let's say the bachelor major was in a completely remote field, not fitting to what I just mentioned. Let's say what you said, animal science or so, that would be certainly exotic. But if the uh, other parts of the application would speak for someone who is really interested, then we just would talk to you. So then um, the typical thing is you would see me here in Zoom and we would chat for half an hour and <laughs> just, just talk whether or not it makes sense. Yeah. Which means they still have chances. Uh, if they yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, Professor Alp, you also uh, introduced three uh, double degree programs here. Uh, one of them will be Erasmus Plus and two of them will be EIT. Would you like to probably talk more about this? I think it's going to be a great opportunity for them uh, if they are trying to explore different uh, research environment uh, in Europe. And what will be the uh, application procedure for these? Are they, are, 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 Which, there's a that you were asking uh, for the European programs? Yeah. The, yeah, uh, okay. yeah, yeah the okay. That's also a good point, Jade. Um, so, um, yeah. So the the three European programs, which I think are also really attractive to, to international students, and that's where, where they're designed for, um, the application procedure is different. So um, even though all programs I mentioned at the end get you a master certificate from TU Darmstadt, only the non-European program is the admission runs through our university. If you now, after my presentation, think, well, one of these Europeans is interesting because I could spend a year in Germany and then go to Belgium or to Finland, then you have to apply directly to these programs. Right. So what you have to do is to go on our website and then uh, it, it says before studies, which is kind of irritating, and then you go on master and then you're directed to the web pages of these programs. They have typically their deadlines um, in beginning of next year. Mm -hmm. And since, since these programs are, as I said, all offering also support in terms of, of scholarships, so there is money involved. <laughs> um, they, are, they are highly competitive because um, there's only a limited budget. Right. Um, so if you, and then that's essentially there's two, two options. If you are uh, not asking for financial support, um, then, uh, or let's say the, the criteria to be admitted are essentially the same, but uh, so you have to have a certain quality, but then only the best out of the best get the scholarships, which is saying the others are also admitted, but they don't get the financial support. Um, but the important thing is this doesn't go through the, regular admission process of our university, but it's uh, for every program an individual application procedure that you find on the web page. At the end, we also see the applications because, but when we decide about the students, we're sitting at a table with people from Helsinki, from Aveiro, from Liege, and make decisions about whom we do accept, yeah. Oh, I just uh, have a quick ask, um, uh, personal uh, questions from myself. Uh, so for a student from Erasmus, uh, for example, would have a class, the same classes with a normal program uh, students? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the, these students of the European programs, they join the very same classes as the Darmstadt students. So there's no difference. There is just minor modifications which I just tried to show in my slides in the in the study program because it, it was adjusted to to meet the requirements of the partners but it's a very same classes yeah and it's a lot of fun because you have a very international community people from all over the world which is also yes yeah, something which which I think one, one should consider I mean it's 
uh, if you think about is that an option for me it's not that you're only sitting with foreign germans in one one room but there is really you can be next to guy from venezuela from the us from island or whatsoever i mean we are really international there is a a fair fraction of people from from asia so you're probably not the only uh, chinese speaking person but it's it's a mixture and uh, what i what i love to see that the people from the different communities also mix so it's uh, it's not <laughs> that they the Indians or the Chinese or whatever, the Koreans stay among themselves, but there's really a, a wonderful interaction. I think this is where we need to go uh, on this road uh, to make a better life possible at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think it's also something to consider when you're thinking about studying abroad. But would it be would it be harder to say get into to Darmstadt? through this double degree program since it's more competitive you have like um... yeah i mean uh, hard or not in the sense of um no i mean if just to enter the program again if you would enter a regular program we just go after the quality of students and you're admitted to this university on on that level um um, it's not hard or easier to get into the one of the international programs the only difference is that they have a tuition fee and again um, the dividing line is essentially to be among the students who get financial support um, so this is so it's it's to to yeah be admitted and to get approved for one of the scholarships uh, that is certainly another level um, and and clearly and then this is why we we try to support students it's another challenge if you face a program where you spend one year in Darmstadt and another year at another place and you have to change, find a new apartment and so on. Um, and living expenses are also different. If you go, for instance, to Helsinki, it's more expensive than Darmstadt. Um, and so we, we try to, to help the students to um, kind of make, make these things possible. Um, so, yeah, if you're after the scholarships, it's harder uh, to get into the programs. It's the same criteria as the ones I, I just mentioned. Yeah. And also, uh, many arts uh, session is about master program. I would just have a quick question that we received uh, regarding the bachelor program. So in order to enroll in the bachelor program, first, first of all, they, they need to speak a uh, very good level of uh, German. Yeah. Uh, what if they are uh, currently IB students, like international school students? Uh, what would be the qualification for them to, in, to uh, apply for a, a bachelor program uh, at uh, TU Darmstadt? So you mean you have to have a, a high school degree, which is comparable to what we call Abitur, so the, to the German one, and that is well defined. I think there is an official list, uh, even for several countries. I mean, Claudia knows it better. Uh, that you can look up and as it comes to the to the language Claudia at C1 or what do we ask for for the German yeah yeah, yeah we asked the students to prove C1 level and that could be like different kind of tests for example in uh, Taiwan you can do test duff mm -hmm. and you need C1 level so you need four times four points in this test and also for uh, in general high school students need to take uh, it's a it's a uh, university entrance exam and reach 53 uh, score but for IB students uh, or AP students they don't really take uh, this kind of exam it, uh, is there any alternative for them or should they uh, what will be the application procedure for them Mm -hmm. I think the students who take IB because it's not a Taiwanese uh, test, they can find on the, for example, on the DAAD website, they can find all the regulations, all the subjects they have to have in the last two years of the IB, right. which is same for all German universities. So that's not a specific one for TU Darmstadt. Yeah, on that level, there's an agreement on the national scale whom to admit, and that also applies to international ones. So yeah, as Claudia says, there's no uh, individual decisions possible on the university level. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions we received today here uh, for our session. Um, so again, thank you, Professor Albert.
uh, thank you, Claudia, for coming up here uh, with us again. Um, and hopefully, uh, the information you found here tonight would uh, help you to prepare for your uh, degree or preparation or your application in the future. And anything to say from Professor Alban and Claudia to our audience? Yeah, thank you for joining. Uh, I hope you take a little information back home. And now if you start thinking, should I do it? I didn't understand that. Feel free to contact us here again. Uh, it's our webpage. And uh, the, if, if there are specific questions, just send an email to master at Mavi, which is essentially German for material science aberration to Darmstadt, and then you get an answer. This is the guys, uh, Ruben Bischler and Hannah Sonderfeld, to uh, overview the application procedure, and they can help in details. And just feel free to, uh, to ask whatever comes to your mind, even if it's only in a year from now that you're thinking about applying. Don't be shy. Uh, this is where we are paid for. Okay, thank you for joining. Also from my side, thank you very much. And if you have any information, just have a look on our website or drop us an email as well. All right. Thank you both. And thank you all the audience here to join us. And we hope to see all of you here again, uh, probably next year, not online, but in Germany and somewhere in Darmstadt. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Hmm.